I'm holding this apple in my hand because of a reason. Because I hope it will inspire me. It will give me some new ideas. Because human history is replete with examples of inspiring apples. I know not all of them have been very inspiring, but we only want to talk about the positive ones, the good apples. For example, there was this English gentleman. He was sitting in his garden, and he saw this apple fall, and he had an amazing idea. And no, it's not about that apple that you are thinking of. I'm not talking about Isaac Newton and the gravity apple. I'm talking about a different English gentleman. I'm talking about Mr. Roald Dahl, the gentleman who gave us wonderful characters like Willy Wonka from Charlie and Jack Chocolate Factory and Big Fat Giant from Big Fat Giant. Roald Dahl, he had this amazing habit of observing these apple trees. He would sit in his garden and he would observe these apples for hours. And one day he started thinking, what if these apples, after they fall, they don't stop growing? What if they just keep growing? What if they just keep getting bigger and bigger? And that gave him the idea of one of his most popular stories, James and the giant peach. Apple and peach? Well, you have to understand, when this story was written, late Mr. Steve Jobs was still a toddler. So apples were still not cool enough. And Roald Dahl actually thought that peach looks cute and apple does not. So he said, apple, you go out and I'll write about peach. <laughs> After writing James and the Giant Peach, he went on to write some 17 more children's books and numerous short stories till the end of his life. He was amazingly prolific because he was amazingly disciplined. Every morning, he would wake up early, and he would start writing. And he would write till the noon, every day. He would write whether he had an idea or not. He would write whether he would like what he was writing or not. He would write whether he felt inspired or not. He would write whether the story was over or not. He would write. And that's why he rarely suffered from what we call a writer's block or a creative block. But not all of us are like Roald Dahl. Some of us, quite often, we get stuck. We face this creative block. And some of us, in that moment, we even abandon what we are doing just because we run out of ideas. And some of us, in that process, we, we abandon the very dream, the very passion that we have been working on. And that's why it is important to, to know how to deal with these moments. It is important how to overcome these blocks. I'm very lucky. As an academician, as a, as a researcher since my PhD, I have had an opportunity to observe creative individuals in a very objective manner. And also, personally, yeah, that's me. I have, uh, once upon a time, <laughs> I have dabbled, uh, well, more than a bit in theater. Also, I'm blessed. Uh, with a family with full of creative people. Uh, my wife is a professional artist. My sister is a professional artist. So I have also seen and observed creative people very personally. So for the last couple of years, I have been working on this problem where I have tried to understand what do people do, what kind of tricks they use when they want to get out of this moment of a block. And after collecting some 300 different tricks, I analyze them, and I have seen three clear strategies that people use. So today I'm going to talk about those three strategies that people successfully use to overcome those blocks. And then I'm also going to talk about a proactive strategy, which can make sure that whatever you do, you are likely to be a bit more creative than usual. So the very first strategy is a strategy that I call show up strategy. When you run out of ideas, just show up for work. Just keep doing it. Basically, it's a strategy of perseverance. 
Many years ago, I was doing this play. It was a French play uh, from the absurd theater tradition, badly translated in English, and it was presented to an Indian audience. <laughs> now you know why my acting career never took off. <laughs> so there was this play, and in that play there was a sentence, a dialogue, which was like, you have to catch words in the air before they fall onto deaf ears. It was deep, yeah. <laughs> so, you have to catch words in the air before they fall onto deaf ears. Now, it was not really coming out well. So one day we decided, okay, let's just rehearse this statement as many times as possible. And we started rehearsing. You have to catch words in the air before they fall onto deaf ears. You have to catch words in the air before they fall onto deaf ears. You have to catch words in the air before they fall onto deaf ears. You have to catch words in the air before they fall onto deaf ears. You have to catch words in the air before they fall onto deaf ears. <laughs> That's the magic of perseverance. With every repetition, a new layer of expression emerged. Charlie Chaplin calls this Perseverance to the height of madness. When you are stuck, when you cannot think of something new, you run out of ideas, just keep doing it, and you will have a new solution. The other strategy, the second strategy, is what I called shoe off yourself strategy. You have run out of ideas, so shoe yourself off from work. Basically, this is a strategy of disconnecting from your work and seeking an insider outside your work. For example, a designer, Michael C. Place, he writes in one of the books that if you are stuck, you cannot think of a new idea, go home, prepare yourself some good meal, then serve yourself some nice red wine, preferably from Australia or New Zealand, Nobody's perfect. <laughs> then enjoy this meal. And then, when you finish this, go to the kitchen and start cleaning the dish. And when you are cleaning the dish, suddenly the clutter in your mind is also getting cleared. And by the end, a new perspective emerges. So enjoy and savor the moment with another glass of wine. <laughs> so this is his way of seeking an insider outside his work. Now, some of you may say, well, but how do we know precisely what kind of an insider will definitely work for us? Well, some people actually work for that. Some people create an inventory for that. Twyla Tharp, one of the greatest choreographers of all time, what she does is that whenever she has a new project, she creates a box where she puts everything that she finds to be interesting, stimulating, exciting. Interesting photograph, it goes to the box. Interesting article, goes to the box. Interesting painting, goes to the box. It's like creating a jukebox of inspiration. And whenever she's stuck, whenever she runs out of ideas, she goes to the box, explores it, and she comes out with an answer. This is the disconnecting, the inciting strategy of creating new ideas. The third strategy, it's what I call steel strategy. And no, I'm not really advocating plagiarism or copying or anything. But what I'm advocating here is empathizing with someone and in that process, stealing somebody else's perspective. I'll give you an example. Billy Wilder, one of the greatest directors of all times. In his office, he had written a statement on a wall what would Lubitsch have done? He was talking about Ernst Lubitsch, another iconic director and a mentor for Billy Wilder. So whenever Billy Wilder was stuck, whenever he could not think of a solution, he would think, how would Lubitsch treat the scene? What would Lubitsch do in this case? How would Lubitsch treat this character? And he always had an answer stealing somebody's perspective by empathizing with the person helps you get a new perspective for the problem that you have. So these, these three strategies that we just saw, they are 
reactive strategies. Basically, you respond to a moment of block. Now I'm going to talk very briefly about a strategy which may help you make sure that you are going to be creative. And that is the strategy that I call procrastination. <laughs> procrastination basically is a term that comes with, that I have borrowed from Adam Grant. Uh, procrastination basically means you finish your work before the deadline. Now you may say, come on. <laughs> I know, I understand the problem. I mean, I have lots of students, so I know issues that deadlines create. But basically what this strategy is all about is creating space in your work for new perspectives. Now why it may work? It may work because of two important reasons. Number one, psychologists have told us, they have shown us through studies that we all suffer from what we call planning fallacy. That means whenever we make a plan, we think that we will do this plan, we will execute this plan like this, but actually we are overestimating our ability. And that's why most of our projects, they never finish on time. However, this happens when we think that we are able to execute the plan. But when the plan is seemingly impossible, when you know that this is difficult to achieve, something else happens. An economist, Albert Hirschman, when he studied uh, some um, infrastructure projects in third world countries, he saw this phenomenon and he gave an interesting expression for that. He said that when you come across such difficult targets, which are impossible, a benevolent hiding hand comes out to help you. And this is a benevolent hiding hand of human ingenuity and creativity. And that's why when you procrastinate, when you have set yourself a tougher deadline, your mind actively seeks new ways and new solutions to meet your tougher targets. And it brings creativity in your work. And why is it necessary? Why do we need to do that? Because we live in an age where information is ubiquitous. Knowledge is easily accessible. And that's why the only currency you have is your ideas and your creativity. The thin line between being creative and being productive is getting blurred very easily. You need to be both. In fact, a very senior and one of the earliest Argentine movie directors, Fernando Birri, one day was interacting with students. And he was advocating students that, you know, you should try to do new things, you should try to be creative. And somehow in the talk it transpired that, you know, being creative is like chasing utopia. So some students said, why should we chase utopia? So Fernando said, well, wait, wait. Utopia serves a very important function. Chasing utopia is like chasing horizon. What happens when you walk towards horizon? Do you actually touch that horizon? Do you actually grab that horizon? No. But when you decide to touch that horizon and you walk towards that, with every step, you are closer to that horizon. And since horizon is still there, you keep walking. Being creative is like that. When, when you, you decide, decide to be creative, you may not come up with the most creative idea, but with every step, you will be closer to that objective and you will keep walking. So I hope these strategies that I have talked about have inspired you enough to keep walking and find your falling apple. My God, wait, wait, wait. I'm having an idea. Maybe I can use this as a logo for something. <laughs> so, all the best. Thanks for your attention. Namaste.